Since our independence, Singapore has pursued sustainable development on a long-term basis, never compromising our environment for development or growth. Mr. Eric Solheim, Executive De Director of the UN Environment Programme, cited us as a model for other countries. Our pioneers clean up the Singapore River, they built sewers to improve sanitation, they resettled street vendors to hawker centres to clean up our streets. They built rubbish chutes to handle our waste efficiently. They planned carefully so that industries did not pollute our environment. Our pioneers had the foresight and gumption to plan long term even if critical measures were difficult and unpopular. Their steadfastness, their steadfastness left us this livable environment we enjoy today. They laid the foundation for the next generation to build on. Our clean waterways allow us to harvest storm water on large scale. Our sewer networks join up through the Deep Tunnel Sewage System, DTSS, to maximize new water production. Because we have always processed our sewage for safe discharge, new water was possible on a national scale and cheaper to produce. Our hawker centres have evolved into vibrant social spaces. Pneumatic systems will transform waste collection, where sanitation workers won't see our rubbish from end to end. We can continue to be proud of our living environment. I hosted 150 international environmental scientists and UN officials last month. <coughs> Many have never been to Singapore. They were amazed by how Singapore can be an urban, clean, and green city, all at the same time, and always looking new. What our pioneers bequeathed us has put us in good state to tackle a bigger, a bigger upcoming challenge, climate change. This is an existential issue for our planet. Singapore is vulnerable from rising sea levels to increasing rainfall intensities, to longer dry spells. I agree with engineer Dr. Lee Biwa that we need to take climate action now for the sake of our next generation. If the previous generation left us a clean and green city, we must, take, we must make our legacy a sustainable city as we pass on this treasured and precious land to our children. At home, 2017, was the warmest non-El Nino year. We swung to the other extreme in the new year with a January Singapore winter and intense rainfall. On 8th January, half the month average rainfall fell over four hours in Singapore, but little rain fell in Lingyu Reservoir. In February, high tides caused temporary flooding even without rain. With rising sea levels, we could experience much more of much such phenomena. I would like to assure Mr. Louis Ng that the government is coordinated in tackling climate change. As climate change cut across various disciplines, the Inter-Ministerial Committee on Climate Change, chaired by DPMTO and supported by the National Climate Change Secretariat, ensures whole of government coordination. All public sector agencies are committed to taking climate action in 2018 and beyond. Last year, we launched the Public Sector Sustainability Plan, setting out longer-term targets to save electricity and water and green our buildings. We will do more by expanding our targets to include waste reduction and solar energy adoption. The government, however, cannot deal with climate change alone. Everyone needs to join forces to reduce our carbon footprint. This is why Singapore designated 2018 as our year of climate action. We want to embed in Singapore's DNA the instinct to care for the environment, like our national consciousness for conserving water. Because both are existential issues. This will ensure that Singapore remains the best livable city for our children, and the best choice for companies to base their businesses here because we have successful climate action policy and also we have active citizenry. 
We must ensure our policies enable Singapore to tackle climate change as we prepare for the future. As a 17th February Economist article aptly puts it, and I quote, it is not droughts that cause cities to run out of water. It is bad policy. Climate action is taken on two fronts. First, adaptation. To cope with the impact of climate change, we have and we will continue to invest billions of dollars in infrastructure such as raising our coastal roads, enhancing stormwater systems, and diversifying our water supply. All this will take time, and hence we have started early. These are large and long-term investments that must be premised on science. Hence, in 2013, we set up the Centre for Climate Research Singapore to deepen research capabilities on the weather and climate of Singapore and Southeast Asia. Mr. Chairman, the Singapore water story is one where we strive for sustainability through long-term planning and investing ahead of our needs. This approach is more critical with climate change, where we need to grapple with both extremes of drought and flooding. Last year, I spoke about Netherlands and Singapore, two countries with different water stories, Netherlands with too much water and Singapore with too little. But nonetheless, how we both take our situation seriously. This year, let me speak about Cape Town and Singapore, two cities with similar water stories which have taken very different paths. And as Mr. Sia Kamping has said, since 2014, a three-year drought has pushed Cape Town's water system to the brink. <coughs> its reservoir stands at 26%. They are scrambling to build desalination plants, starting from now. But these take time to build. Residents are bracing themselves for day zero. When their taps will be turned off and they are forced to queue to get their water rations. For Singapore, there were concerns regarding Lingyu Reservoir, which supplements the flow of the Johor River, an important water source for both Singapore and Malaysia. Lingyu was full in 2014, but low rainfall, coupled with having to meet the attraction needs of Malaysia and Singapore, depleted Lingyu to a historic low of 20% in October 2016, barely two years. Saltwater intrusions and pollution require Lingyu to discharge frequently during such a critical period. While the stock level has gradually improved to 63%, it took more than a year, mainly due to good rainfall and the completion of the Johor River Barrage. But the stock level can drop again quickly, and it has dropped in the last few weeks. Should Lingyu Reservoir fail, it will pose major problems for both Malaysia and Singapore. Water is both a sensitive and strategic issue for the two countries. This is why it is often discussed when the two Prime Ministers meet. What Cape Town experienced is not a remote possibility for Singapore. We must not wait for a crisis to take action. Our forward planning ensured that in 2016, when Lingyu was at its lowest, we did not burden our people with water rationing when others had to. The faith of businesses in our water supply was not eroded. Fortunately, the weather turned. But the next dry weather event can come anytime, and it could even be longer. We must be ready, we must never believe that our problems are over. Over the years, we have augmented our water supply weather resilient sources new water and desalinated water. This year, our third desalination plant in Tuas will come online. By 2020, we'll have two more, taking the total to five. Mr. Gan Tianpo asked about our used water plants. New water has allowed us to reuse water in an endless cycle and to keep the water within the system safe to drink. Even with these investments, it does not mean <coughs> that our water scarcity issue is resolved. It only allows us to stave off temporary water shortages. These sources are also energy intensive, 
And we do not want to be too energy reliant in our drive to be weather resilient. This is why PUB has always been exploring technologies to reduce energy consumption in desalination. There is promise in the use of electrochemical energy, waste heat, and biomimicry. But it will take time to realize these benefits. The climate challenge is not all negative. For example, a carbon constraint framework has prompted NEA and PUB to take a different approach when they were expanding, they're going to expand, expanding their capacities. They are looking at leveraging the interconnectedness of water and energy and waste to yield the best outcomes for the smallest carbon footprint. The upcoming DTSS phase two is not just a super highway to transport used water. It's a strategic infrastructure to boost our new water supply and enhance our water security. But we are taking it one step further. By combining the TWAS water reclamation plan at the end of the TSS and the integrated waste management facility, the first in the world from ground up, we will employ the latest technology in combustion to synergize and maximize energy recovery. Effluent water from wastewater treatment will be used for cooling waste incineration equipment, reducing portable water demand. Through integration, we will save more than 200,000 tons of carbon emissions a year. This is equivalent to taking 42,500 cars off the road. As an added benefit, when the DTSS is completed, we will have a land saving of 214 football fields, which we can give to the next generations to use. Water is entwined with our nation's survival and our everyday lives. It's not enough that the government pumps billions of dollars into infrastructure and ensures supply. Policies to manage demand are as important. The right pricing policy is needed to ensure good management of this precious resource. We saw how subsidized water price <coughs> led to high consumption in Cape Town, despite clear warnings of impending water crisis. Pricing is hence critical to manage both production and consumption. It must allow for long-term investments and reflect the scarcity value of water. These principles shape our pricing policy. While we pack our water price to its long-run marginal cost, or LRMC in short, this has been our consistent policy. The RMC is not a theoretical price. We will actually have to pay it when we spend on infrastructure. Hence, we cannot subject the price of water to market distortions. There are commercial sensitivities to the specifics of our pricing. By not revealing them, we ensure market competitiveness and the best possible bids in tenders. Beyond market sensitivities, water is a matter of national security. We must pay equal attention to water conservation. Prior to the drought, Cape Town was using 225 liters per person per day. Now they're struggling to cut back to 50. I'm encouraged by the drop in Singapore's household consumption from 148 liters in 2016 to 143 per person per day in 2017. I hope that this trend can continue. I said last year that with the permanent additional use safe rebates, one and two rumours will not see an increase in water bills even after the full price revision. At this lower consumption rate, many three rumours will also not see an increase when the rebates are applied. Water bills after the full price revision will still be within 1% of a household income. The lower consumption, however, is not solely due to the water price. Our water conservation efforts like the mandatory water efficiency labeling scheme are bearing fruits. Engineer Dr. Lee Biwa, Mr. Sia Kiamping, Mr. Peng Eng Huat asked about water conservation efforts. Our water conservation efforts are yielding results because Singaporeans have a national consciousness 
to conserve water. As part of PUB's comprehensive outreach program, many schools are inculcating this consciousness in our children through education and water rationing exercises. Similarly, government agencies have committed to improve water efficiency by 5.1%, or 900,000 cubic meters a year by 2020 under, pub under the Public Sector Sustainability Plan. PUB started the Water Closet Replacement Project last year to help needy families save water with more efficient fittings. 1,100 households have already benefited <coughs> and saw a 10% reduction in their water bills on average. This builds on HDB's Home Improvement Program, where participating households can replace their fittings with water-efficient ones. PUB will continue to engage other eligible households. Mr. Pritam Singh raised some suggestions on encouraging the take-up of water-efficient appliances, including offering rebates. According to PUB's latest household water consumption study, more than half of the water fittings and appliances used by households are water-efficient models. This high penetration indicates preference for water-efficient products, especially as the price difference between products of varying water efficiency ratings is insignificant. PUB will continue to work with suppliers and retailers to introduce more water-efficient products. As part of the Smart Nation push, we'll also use technology to encourage behavioural change towards water conservation and enhance operational productivity. PUB will be embarking on a smart shower program. Up to 10,000 new homes will be equipped with smart shower devices under a demonstration project. These devices provide real-time feedback to actual water consumption during showers. An NUS pilot involving 500 households showed water savings of 5 litres per person per day, on average. Mr. Gan Tiampo asked about the automated meter reading or AMR system. PUB has been conducting trials on AMR systems to replace current meters that have to be read manually. AMR meters can be read remotely and provide high-resolution water consumption data. Results have been encouraging. Let me give you one example. Mr. Ms. Jacqueline Chan's family participated in PUB's trial in June 2017. Through a mobile app, the Chan family can track and take steps to reduce their daily water usage. They have also saved about 8,000 litres of water after being alerted by their app to a leak in their water closet. We will explore how this system can be implemented nationwide. The non-domestic sector must also play their part. Companies can tap on the Water Efficiency Fund and the Industrial Water Solutions Demonstration Fund to support water savings efforts. PUB is collaborating with industry to use the data collected through the Water Efficiency Management Plans to develop sectorial water efficiency benchmark and best practices. PUB has worked with the building sector, including offices, hotels and retails, to publish a best practices guide. Growing and right pricing our water supply go hand in hand with managing water demand. The sum of all that we do will prepare us for the future. For now, there is no need for national water rationing exercises. If we can get our policies right, we will avoid day zero. Mr. Chairman, with climate change, Singaporeans will experience more frequent intense rainstorms. Dr. Chia Silu asked for an update on PUB's plans to mitigate flash floods. I gave a comprehensive reply in this House on 5th February. PUB has set higher drainage standards since 2011, up to 45% capacity increase, but our drains cannot be built to accommodate every extreme rainfall event. This will entail massive land take and much higher costs. We have thus adopted a holistic source pathway receptor approach. This complement continuous island-wide drainage improvement works. The works at Stanford Diversion, Diversion Canal, Stanford Detention Tank, and Bukit Timah First Diversion Canal will be completed in 2018. Work will commence at another 22 locations this year, adding to existing works at 73 locations. 
As flash floods cannot be completely eliminated, we will help members of the public better cope by providing timely situation updates, including SMS alerts about water levels. Those who wish to receive alerts from more than one water level can write in to PUB. Mr. Leon Pereira asked about coastal protection. Over 70% of our coastline is protected by hard walls or stone embankments. To protect against rising sea levels, we raised minimum reclamation levels by one meter in 2011 to at least four meters above mean sea level. We will build Changi Airport Terminal 5 at 5.5 meters above mean sea level. To address Singapore's long-term protection needs, the Building Construction Authority is conducting a coastal adaptation study to recommend a national framework. Scientists also worry about pests and vector problems escalating with climate change. The concerted effort by all stakeholders in response to the 2016 Zika outbreak and our vector control actions contributed to the drop in the number of dengue cases in 2017, almost five times slower than in 2016. However, we also observed a significant increase in mosquitoes caught in gravity traps. We cannot become complacent. While we continue with premise inspections, everyone can play their part by practicing the five-step mozi wipe up. Climate change may worsen the spread of mosquito-borne diseases such as Chika and Chikugunya. We are studying how male Wolbachia-carrying Aedes mosquitoes can be used to suppress the mosquito population. We'll conduct further studies this year to strengthen our planning for an eventual suppression trial. Climate change can also affect other vectors such as rodents and house flies. I encourage all to do our part by practicing good everyday habits such as disposing our food waste properly at home and retaining our trays in hawker centres to prevent pests in our homes and communities. Mr Chairman, Besides climate adaptation, we also need to take mitigation action, which is what we do to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases, or GHG. One big focus is in energy efficiency, for which we enhanced the Energy Conservation Act last year. We are using more solar energy, we have more green buildings, with more stringent standards in energy efficiency. Good transport policy will mitigate climate change. This is what the car light -like policy will do. By 2030, 8 in 10 households will live within 10 minutes of a train station. We have frozen the growth of our car population starting last month. All this will reduce our fossil fuel use and carbon footprint. Last year, I announced the new vehicular emission scheme to promote cleaner new vehicles. NEA enforces against smoky foreign vehicles at our checkpoints. We have tightened the turnback limit since January this year. My ministry is reviewing how to reduce vehicular pollution from older, more polluting vehicles. We'll announce our recommendations in due course. Our industries can do more to mitigate climate change. A KPMG study found that only 17% of local firms have carbon reduction targets. The carbon tax is the latest component of our wide-ranging mitigation measures. Ms. Cheng Li Hui asks whether the carbon tax is the most effective way to reduce emissions. Pricing will encourage companies to evaluate opportunities to switch to more energy-efficient technologies and more sustainable processes. I spoke to Mr. Jagadesh, CEO of SSMC, a semiconductor solutions company recently. I was told that they are committed to a 30% reduction in GHG emission in their process <coughs> design. As small companies like SSMC reduce the carbon footprint, whether through improved processes or when designing new investments, they also improve the Singapore brand premium and reputation for green practices. Across the world, young people passionate about our planet will demand this as consumers. An NEA poll showed that close to 70% of the public was supportive of a carbon tax. 
Mr. Lewis Ng asked how we decided on a starting tax rate of $5 per tonne, which we intend to raise to $10 to $15 by 2030. We aim to strike a balance between providing sufficient incentive for companies and Singaporeans to reduce their carbon emissions and giving them enough time to adjust. <coughs> Our carbon tax will be applied uniformly without exemptions. Other overseas jurisdictions may have significant exemptions for particular sectors. This would lower the effective tax rate. Hence, our starting tax rate cannot be directly compared with those of other jurisdictions. The carbon tax will apply to larger direct emitters, companies emitting 25 kilotons or more of GHG emissions a year, around 40 companies, which account for about 80% of Singapore's GHG emissions will be affected. We will introduce a fixed price credits based system where companies will purchase and surrender credits to pay for carbon tax. The FBCB system is akin to a carbon tax, but it will allow us and companies to build capability to operate in a linked market with other carbon pricing jurisdictions if we decide to do so in future. Ms. Cheng Lihui asks about the tax revenue, while Mr. Louis Ng asks about government support measures. The Minister of Finance has said he's prepared to spend more than what we collect in carbon tax in the first five years to support worthwhile projects. We will share more details later. Engineer Dr. Lee Biwa asks about the estimated impact of the carbon tax on households. We expect it to be small at about 1% of total electricity and gas expenses on average. The additional UCF rebates will help households adjust. My ministry will also work with the community to help households reduce their energy consumption. SMS Dr. Amy Kaur will elaborate more. Mr. Chairman, organizations and companies have begun leading the charge. The World Bank will stop financing upstream oil and gas projects from 2019. I'm happy that ExxonMobil, a major investor here and a leader in energy efficiency, and one of the companies affected by our carbon <coughs> tax, has recently pledged to take climate action on Muir's webpage. I quote Mr. Gan Selki, Chairman and MD for ExxonMobil Asia Pacific, that ExxonMobil, I quote, is committed to reducing greenhouse gas emissions in its operation, helping consumers reduce their emissions, and supporting research that leads to technology breakthroughs. Many firms, including many of our SMEs, have made their climate action pledges on Muir's webpage. I'm glad we're taking this journey together. I will not touch on waste. Striving towards a zero waste nation is another key focus of this year's climate action. We must reduce, reuse, and recycle more. A McKinsey study showed that to make one kilogram of fabric, 23 kilogram of greenhouse gases is produced. We are running out of space to store our waste. If we continue business as usual, we will need a new landfill the size of three gardens by the bay every 35 years. Waste does not magically disappear and when we, throw, when we throw it down, our rubbish shoots. Ms. Cheng Li Hui asks how Singaporeans and businesses can play a role in Singapore becoming a zero-waste nation. Everyone must play a part. The government will lead in developing infrastructure and frameworks, including legislations where required. But Singaporeans and businesses must participate. Beyond legislation, our people, companies, and civic organizations can demonstrate leadership with ground-up efforts. In Singapore, we have closed the water loop and achieved the circular economy in our water sector. We should apply the circular economy to the waste sector. The circular economy is also on the global agenda, where materials are reused and recycled for as long as possible. As a CEO of an African NGO said, there is no such thing as waste until it is wasted. We will introduce the Extended Producer Responsibility, EPR, approach as a key strategy in waste and resource management. Traditionally, 
Producers are only concerned about the design, manufacture, and use of their products. The EPR approach extends their responsibility to include the proper recycling and disposal of the products at the end of life. Manufacturers and importers will take charge of the waste they produce rather than the society bearing the cost. By doing so, businesses are also incentivized to design products that last longer and can be more easily recycled. We will start with e-waste. SMS, Dr. Amy Kaur will share more details on setting up a national e-waste management system using the EPR approach. As we strive to be a zero-waste nation, we will turn brown into gold. As we engage in urban mining, as we recover treasure from trash, as we grow and transform a vibrant environmental services industry with good jobs for Singaporeans. And most important of all, as we build a sustainable and living home for our children. Professor Fashal asks what Singapore is doing on the regional and global front for climate action. UN SecGen Antonio Guterres has identified the fight against climate change as one of the top priorities for the UN and for the international community. Singapore supports this. In July, I will lead a delegation to the UN where Singapore will undertake our first voluntary national review of the Sustainable Development Goals. We will use our ASEAN Chairmanship to galvanize support for climate action. Singapore will convene a special ASEAN ministerial meeting on climate action on 10th July and a back-to-back -back expanded meeting with ASEAN and ministers from China, Japan, Korea and UNFCCC, COP President and President-designate Fiji and Poland. This will take place in conjunction with Singapore International Water Week, Clean Enviro Summit Singapore, and World, World Cities Summit joint event. We will share experiences and reaffirm the region's commitment to climate action and the Paris Agreement. We will continue to plug ourselves into the global movement on climate change and work with partners to shape the international agenda. As the saying goes, if we are not at the table, we will be on the menu. To get a seat at the table, we must be credible. This means that Singapore must fulfill our international obligations and show leadership on climate action. Already we've been noticed. Cristiana Figueres, the former executive of UNFCCC, said in an article published locally in Singapore in BT, fortunately, Singapore is attuned to this urgent turning point. Its year of climate action, backed by concrete steps in the domestic <coughs> policy sphere, is the kind of leadership the region needs. Let me conclude. <coughs> to succeed in our climate action endeavor, government's effort alone will never be enough. All Singaporeans have a critical role to play. We do not want to mandate everything. Instead, Singaporeans must feel empowered to take climate action. This is akin to our water story, which was not just the effort of the government, but that of generations of Singaporeans who partners us for the greater good. This is why we have designated 2018 as the year of climate action. It's the start of our journey to raise the level of national consciousness to fight climate change. We will pass this consciousness from generation to generation. This will ensure our children do not end up facing a climate change crisis. Higher sea levels, frequent swings between intense weather or pestilence. They should never have to face a water crisis like Cape Town. I accompanied President Halima for the launch of the Singapore World Water Day last Saturday. What struck me most was when two little girls, Alicia and Abby, asked, what if this was our last drop? Indeed, we must never let our children ask this. Or why is our air so, so polluted? Or why is our sea level rising? Our children are the reason why we need to take climate action now. Taking climate action now is how we shall pass to our children a Singapore that is a livable city evermore, a city where thriving businesses have low carbon footprint, and a city with environmental solutions that are well sought after. We can do this together. Thank you.